Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Now, this is the author day. We just finished with a wonderful author, and now we have someone actually is a friend of mine. She lives outside of Dallas, and we went to, uh, we went to the, well, we lived in Miami together, and when I rediscovered Carol, here she is writing a book, and it's just absolutely wonderful. So, Carol, um, I just want to tell you that uh, your book, A Nickel for the Boatman, the novel, is really special. And I told you this when we talked before because I know so many of the places in that book. And that always makes uh, reading a book fun if you, if you can put yourself in the, in the place. Yes, and you have so much history in that book that people have no idea about. You know, what you talk about down in Homestead and the Keys. And, and, and it's really nice because I know these, we already discussed this, but that your, your father helped you and he told you so many things and that he loves this book that you put together. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, many of the characters were based upon people that he actually knew and uh, and he he spent uh, all of his young years um, hanging around the water um, and exploring uh, along the um, the seawall behind Viscaya. Uh, you know, now, today um, it's hard for anybody because it's such a beautiful you know sort of a place to visit, and they charge admission to go to Viscaya and all. But back in the day, in the twenties, uh, it was. You know, it, it was being occupied, and um, kids in the neighborhood could go up and down the seawall in the back and, uh, you know, um, play around when there was no one out looking <laughs> to see what they were doing. So, yeah. And who, I forget that. Now, now that you mention it, who who was living there? Was that the Deerings? I believe it was the Deerings at that time, yeah. And they weren't, you know, they weren't delighted to have the neighborhood riffraff. <laughs> on their property but uh you know it was it was always such a gorgeous place and um uh you know so for kids living in the neighborhood it was like having a real palace you know (laughs) (laughs) near your near your own house you know Uh, because i guess it was really imported um uh, piece by piece i mean i think that it was imported from somewhere i'm from not Italy, really yes sure. Vizcaya, I from think, Italy, yeah. yeah it was it was, really was this very very special you don't i don't know did i mention this that my son and his wife were married at Vizcaya? did i tell you that last no time? no you didn't yep they, didn't. they were married there because it was such an elegant place to be married and they live probably one mile into um south Mi- right there's a very nice little quaint community they live just down the road in a little from there which is really how yeah it's interesting Lovely. It's right well, off I, Brickle. I recall uh, off Brickle Avenue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I recall uh, when I was in high school, uh, they we <laughs> our high school did a calendar, uh, uh, and they chose some of the girls, um, and you know, so there were twelve of us who were chosen to be pages in the calendar, and they <laughs> took us to the sky. <laughs> I can imagine why around. this beautiful woman, right? <laughs> so, do you have that calendar today? No, I don't. Oh. I don't. I, I think my my mother had had a copy of of it put away someplace, but she's gone now, so I have no idea. Right. Well, that's. Uh, but there are so many historical places in Miami that people really have no idea about, and it requires. You know, writing a book like yours, because this, yours is not really a travel book. It's a it's an exciting novel, but it has characters who are some are gruesome. I mean, some are, you know, very, you know, they're they're um, gangsters. And then you have some nice people. But you wove through that whole novel, the locations, just like, you know, the Al Capone on Palm Island and all that. That's what made it so right. believable. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I did a lot of research um, so that I could get the details right. Well, and of course you were an English teacher, right? So you... I was, yes, for many years. So that helped you uh, accomplish this. But you know, I remember when you and I were both there in Miami, in the University of Miami, 
I don't know if you've been back lately, but it sure doesn't look like that. Oh, no, I haven't been back for years, but I, even the last time I did come down, I, it was probably, oh, 15 years ago at least, um, and I, I was astonished. I, I felt that I wouldn't even be able to find my way around. <laughs> I, it, you know, I was, <laughs> if, I were, if I had been in a rental car instead of with someone else, I would have been totally lost. <laughs> Well, of course, we have that one, you know, US-1, which takes you all around. Right, there. right, exactly. But it's amazing. And I suppose what, that does. Yeah, but what they've done with the western part out there, I mean, Dadeland and Kendall, but it goes west. I mean, in fact, FIU, which is Florida International University, is now way, way, way west. I mean, there are things uh, that I'd like to go to see there, but it's too far away. Right, right, yes. Do you remember when... You know, when we when we lived there, I think you and I made a trip across um, on what used to be the Tamiami Trail that cut across from uh, Miami to right. Naples, I right. think. Which is now and, Alligator and it, Alley, right? Yes, Alligator Alley, right. And but but I mean, you know, those uh, those areas uh, around, and even even up as far as Lake Okeechobee um, are are you know wonderful nature sanctuaries now which is a wonderful thing that you know that happened well so let's just talk a little bit about your book so uh how does it come to someone who's such a gentle person as you to write some gory things about murder how do you <laughs> how do you do that well actually i think the idea might have been sparked by my son to, um, you know, I had given him a copy of the manuscript when I was just really just starting to work on it. I had maybe three or four chapters done. And he he suggested, he said, you know, I think you really need to have, uh, you know, uh, you need to open with something that's really exciting and <laughs> so forth. And <laughs> yeah, right. so, uh, so I, that's how I kind of conceived the idea that, uh, you know, that the, all of these things that had happened to Edward Boyd when he was a young boy come, sort of come back to haunt him in his old age. And he has nightmares and so forth about the Everglades and about th the things that happened to him when he was younger. Um, and uh, having spent some time in the Everglades, um, you know, I can... Easily, I could easily imagine some of those things taking place. Uh, you know, that would be a perfect place to bump bump someone off. <laughs> you know now, get rid of their bodies. right? Do you all. know now in the Everglades they they're loaded with boa constrictors? I actually I had heard that recently. Yes, what a I mean, terrible thing! It's terrible. <laughs> I guess they were imported, yeah. and and yeah. a lot of them got away. And Ex or or them. people had little ones, or they you know, and then they decided yeah. to get rid of them, and then they must. Oh, it's really a terrible thing, and they don't even know how to get rid of them now. <laughs> I know it's like the old the old tales of the uh, people who came back to New York with alligators, which you know you used to be able to. Everybody who came to Miami back in the old days, you know, <laughs> wanted to take a baby <laughs> alligator home, oh, right. and they let them loose in the in the New York sewers. <laughs> oh, I don't know that. Uh, yeah, is that what happened? So yeah, well, that that was it is probably an urban legend, but you know, maybe you not. Can maybe not. Do you remember know. when you came down to Miami in the tourists, they would wind up with these little, small, little, tiny crates with little orange gum balls or something in them? That, oh, that were supposed to look like little oranges. Yeah, exactly. And they would take, yes. you'd mail them back because here's some oranges from Florida. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do. I do. And in fact, one of the scenes um, in the book that takes where. Eddie, the main character, and Manny, his sort of mentor, are walking through uh, one of the fruit stands um, down, actually, and um, that was actually um, a, a place. I mean, the, the details of that fruit stand came from my, my memory of a fruit stand that was near the elementary school that I attended huh. when I was a kid because I, I, even though my family moved out near the airport, uh, I still went to a school that was near, um, ah, I've forgotten that, that the name fruit, of the... That fruit stand, huh? Near that fruit 
understand. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I, they, there were always, uh, you know, uh, painted coconuts that were supposed to you right. know, be carved out to look like heads and masks. And, and the smell, when I wrote that chapter, I could still smell the smell huh. of the fruit. Right. You know, there, because they would have the crates, like you're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, that we, you know, with uh, oranges individually wrapped in green uh, tissue and, for, you know, to entice people. But the smell was just something that you never forget. Well, that's very interesting. Well, one thing as you're talking, I'm remembering the park that we loved is still there. Just like that is a park. It was along Biscayne, along US 1, and it was, I think, when we worked at the university, it was convenient to go there for lunch. Remember? It we was. We used to do these little terrariums. We would collect the stuff for the terrariums. <laughs> I do. That really, I do remember that. That was really um, nice. Well, it's nice to know that that there are parts of Miami that are still, you know, still the way I remembered them. Um, Because when I, as I was writing that book, I thought, you know, if I went back today, I probably wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't recognize anything. And uh, that's, that's sadly true. I suppose no matter where you move, when you come back home, it's never the same way you remembered it. But, uh, but I did um, actually um, speak with, with some people from, you know, that I knew from my days in Miami who had never moved away any place. And they they really enjoyed the uh, descriptive parts of the book because I think, it, you know, I kind of tapped into things that that all of us remembered, even from the 50s, that were still, you know, still the same. Yeah, that really is true. And, and, and when I think about Miami, though, uh, and, and, you know, and there were a few things that really people knew it. And I think that um, having Al Capone, you know, the, it was always the Fontainebleau, it was Al Capone, it was, um, maybe it was Vizcaya, it was Coconut Grove. There were certain places and things that are still there. Even Al Capone's house is still there. It's for, on sale, but, you know, for sale, but they stay. Well, I would hope, you know, I would hope that there are some things that, uh, that, would be considered historical, um, you know, places that they would want to keep intact, uh, because you know it, that's a way that we differ from from Europe, really, in this country, is that uh, we always want to knock everything all down, right. and build new stuff, you know. So, so you didn't have kind of you didn't have anything in there about Venetian pool that I really like. That would have been a great place for a murder. I didn't, and you know, you're right, and and that was, of course, that was a. a a wonderful place that we all went to, and I don't really know. I, I wish that I had, had looked up when it was built, because I, I think it probably was built during the late 20s or early 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all out of coral rock. And, right, and right. made to look like a tropical paradise. And that's something, of course, that all of the, the you know, kids in my generation and yours uh, we spent lots of time in the Venetian pool when yep. we were kids. And Matheson Hammock? Yep. But, and that was one of the only places, Matheson's Hammock, that was really uh, kind of natural, the way it had always been. You know, it, it still had the big um, the mangrove swamps and things around there, you yes. know. Um, but it's interesting that I've, I've had occasion to drive west on Cutler, Old Cutler Road, and uh-huh. it goes, it, I mean, south, it goes, oh, goes and goes and goes. It is so far south. Um, <laughs> right. Well, even even that, you know, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the housing development that they built down uh, um, out U.S. 1, um, Coral Ridge, or no? Yeah, that yeah, was, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, Coral Ridge, I think that was it. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, we felt that was halfway to Homestead. Right. Exactly, <laughs> you <know>? exactly. <laughs> But um, so you, we talked about your writing some more books because you're very talented and and I know that you are an artist. But do you like being a writer? Do you like segregating yourself with your computer and thoughts? Actually, I do. And um, over the period of time that I worked on my two books, um, I would say probably five five years or so. Um, that that's all I did, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I, it, I did it as if it was, um, as if I were going to work. 
So I got up in the morning, I had a cup of coffee, and I sat down with my computer. And sometimes I was still sitting there at five o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, when when you're involved in a project like that, uh, it's, or at least speaking for myself, um, I would forget time and everything else. I would just be so focused on getting getting that chapter finished and hopefully trying to craft craft a book that you know the when you got to the end of of a chapter uh it would be written so you really wanted to keep on reading you didn't want to just put it down and forget about it so i worked hard on that yeah um i i did actually uh i sent uh a, per, a person who was actually quite instrumental in the writing of uh, nickel for the boatman was uh lester Gorin, who uh was a a writer and also a professor at the University of Miami and and a friend of uh, both of ours, I guess. Yeah, I remember Uh, him. And yes, he's he's passed away uh, in the last couple of years, I believe. But um, I sent him uh, a copy of of the manuscript when it was just a little way along. And his comment was, it's wonderfully descriptive, but this is a memoir, not a novel. And so after um, after reading his comments and so forth, I actually went back and even changed the voice of the novel from uh, first person, which was the way I had written it originally, to third person. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So you you had to switch. So and things. that took a lot of work. Yeah, because, yeah, it does. You know, I basically had to go back through and and completely rewrite a lot of parts, but. Uh, you know, I think it works better as a third-person uh, account. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, I love, I, I suppose I was very influenced um, by The Catcher in the Rye. Um, as as an English teacher, that was one of, you know, one of my favorite novels to to uh, to teach. And, Who was that uh, by? I, I forget. I, oh, Salinger. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I loved the fact that he 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 wrote a character that I could identify with. I think any any kid, sixteen, seventeen years old, could really identify with that character. And so when I began developing the character of Eddie, I wanted a character who uh, who who thought things were foolish that adults did, or or questioned things that uh, you know he was supposed to take. Uh, as gospel truth, especially going, you know, a, a, a boy in a Catholic high school who's not supposed to question any of the, you know, religious um, doctrine. And yet, he because he's a naturally curious person, he does question. <laughs> and so I think that made for some uh, kind of funny uh, mm-hmm. moments, you know. Yeah, it did. Definitely. Because, uh, but he, he, uh, it's in, it's interesting to see how somebody can go awry. Here, this kid was pretty nice, but because he was un, you know, people weren't watching over him. He didn't have a kind of family relationship like you know you like to someone to have had. Yeah, they were too busy. <laughs> yeah, too busy, exactly. And he got in trouble. Yep, yep. Because he was, uh, you know, he the slot machines and and the you know idea that you could you could make a quick buck. Uh, at at that time, that was very appealing to him, and uh, he, even though his good friend would have been shocked, so he had to sort of cut off his relationship with his friend for a while while he was engaging in these, you know, uh, uh, questionable activities. Uh, he um, he really the the pull of of the idea of perhaps making deliveries for, you know, the mob, uh, dropping off um, packages or picking up packets of money <laughs> to deliver them to the higher-ups, uh, and being able to make, you know, maybe $5 for that. Well, that was a fortune at that time. So that was very hard for him to um, resist until he finally realizes that he's gotten in way over set. Right. But at first, I don't think he knew he was doing something bad, That because... Yeah. You know, he he always went where the that man was at the shoe shine, right? And yes, yes, he exactly. Really, he didn't know, uh, did he? Do you think well, he knew at the beginning? 
Mm, I think that he he suspects in the beginning, but he finds out very quickly that uh, that Manny is um, does you know is a member of the mob, and when he finds that out, he that kind of causes him to pause a bit and think, "Do I really want to do this?" But then he he just can't resist the idea that you know he could. He could get into these back rooms and find out what really goes on in there, you know. And uh, and there, almost every back room at, in the arcades in Miami at that time had uh, a telephone to, you know, <laughs> the, right. to a bookie, you right. know. And the racetrack was a big deal. So when the people, you know, snowbirds coming in from New York, uh, going to Hialeah Racetrack uh, right. was uh, was very much on the agenda. And so that and gambling was just everywhere, and uh, and uh, the bootleg the bootleg liquor mm. was everywhere too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Well, his uh, but his daughter really that was nice. Where he really came, and I thought of you and your father, although he wasn't didn't do the kinds of things that Eddie did, but he certainly loved his daughter. Well, he loved his daughter, and he found out uh, after having hidden his past for many, many years yeah. that because he was afraid, he, 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 he was afraid that, uh, she wouldn't, that she would be shocked. She wouldn't accept him if she knew the things that had happened to him. Mm-hmm. So it's very painful for him to finally confess to her what has caused him to retreat and kind of, um, cut off from his, from his family. And so he, she, they come back together at a time when he is very, he, he's 87 or something. I've forgotten exactly how old he was. Uh, but he realizes that time for, for him is limited. And if he wants to reestablish a relationship with his daughter, he, he better do it now. <laughs> so. Right. And so um, your, your other book, though, is not about this. You wrote another book. I don't know much about your other book. I did. My other book, Trail of Evil, uh, was um, it, it takes place in Seattle, and it really um, has to do with. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term affluenza, but it's been bandied about in recent years uh, because they're uh, when a very a kid from a really wealthy family gets in big trouble. And there was one who uh, became quite notorious because he he did something really terrible, but he was he was let off with a very almost a slap on the wrist. Uh, and that's called affluenza. Because, uh, well, they that was when the term affluenza came about. His attorney uh, said, "Well, you know, this poor boy suffers from affluenza. You know, meaning." He, he just uh, he's lived a life where there was so much money and really that he he just, you know, thinks that he can do anything. And so the main character in Trail of Evil is a child like that. And, and he's he's a late later teenage boy who goes to a private school and manages to, uh, you know, go in a very bad way and gets involved with the Russian <laughs> the Russian mob. And it becomes a cyber uh, criminal, and uh, so it's a very it's it's a it's a very different book. It's it's really a a, uh, a book about involving you know murder and rape and the things that uh, a wealthy kid could get into mm-hmm. and think that his you know that that his family can buy can buy his freedom. Wow, that he he's, he's above the law <laughs> in effect. What made you do that one? What made you have that theme? Well, actually, uh, I had an experience as a teacher with uh, with a student who, who who ran afoul of the law and uh, was a brilliant, probably certainly a genius, uh, one of the one of the brightest students I ever taught. But he was into um, petty crime from the time he was in junior high and so uh and he eventually did go to prison Mm. 
Well, so, so that's what you I do. Mean, I mean, yeah. but, you know, well, as I say, it was loosely, you know, the, the inspiration probably came from that and, the fa- and, and this other trial that was very much in the news at the time about the very wealthy boy who had been pretty much let off because his fam- family had a lot of money. And all of those things combined, and I said, well, I, I know this story. I can write this story. Right, exactly. And so uh, this is your, and now this book uh, is published? Yes, uh-huh. it's available on um, Amazon. It's, uh, it can be downloaded for Kim, uh, uh, Kindle. And what is or, the name uh, of it? Another, you know, uh, Trail of Evil. Trail of Evil. Trail okay. of Evil. And is it Carol? Uh, how, how do you use both names? Mm-mm. Well, I believe, you know, I don't have a copy of the book title, but I think MC Below uh, is uh, is the the uh, way I'm listed on um, A Nickel for the Boatman. And that's, mm-hmm. I have to say that when I wrote that book, I thought I would have a better chance of getting readers if uh, people thought perhaps I was a man instead really? of a woman. Uh, yeah, because I'm writing about a boy from a boy's point of view and so i thought maybe it would be more believable if they thought that i was a, a man so i i didn't use my first name but the other book i think i'm uh i i'm uh carol Milo, i think mm. well carol Milo, i really have enjoyed this so much and we we will uh, continue to do things together and i thank you so much i love your book and i know people will also love it a nickel for the boatman a novel you can go on uh, amazon.com and you can look up um, Carol Luter Milo L U T E R M I L O T thank you so much and I'll be talking with you great thank you Nita you're welcome bye Carol bye